but it's not like these games are not close. We're seeing AHQ hang in in the gold, take some fights, but the coordination does not seem to be there that at any moment they're taking a breath and strategically taking control of the game. I mean, they don't seem close up until a certain point and then it's just completely over as to how we thought EDG played one fight. They take the game from you and that's what they're doing here. AHQ needs to compose themselves a little bit. They take a lot of fights on and on and try to match EDG and at times they win because that's kind of how they play as well. But they're not even looking at the map. They're taking fights when Westor is split pushing bottoms like, oh, oh, let's fight, let's fight. Oh, Westor wasn't here. Whoops. Yeah, that's a typical 4-1 split push from AHQ that gets punished. So EDG definitely did their homework coming into this. And then their lane swaps too. They're over committing on top side from AHQ and then the turret goes down, EDG gets an advantage there, they swap it back. EDG is just playing it a lot better. The overcommit is what I want to hit on because we talk about both these teams being fight heavy. I think that the difference is, is that AHQ overcommit a little bit more from EDG. I am not saying that EDG don't overcommit <laughs> because they definitely do, but AHQ just seem to want to ride that last little bit of the fight a little bit too far and then it turns around and bites them. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, to the picks and bands point, we were talking about the top lane and how much that might matter here. We saw some, you know, some pretty sweet outplays by Koro in the tower dives early on, but that Hecarim band came through. AHQ prioritized the NAR, but it didn't seem to quite make the difference that they needed coming into this game. Yeah, Koro's still effective on Maokai is the thing. And then Pawn, you know, we talked about him being pretty much the fourth carry. He's like the backup carry of the team. <laughs> when Koro's on some type of tanky top laner, Pawn really has the opportunity to step up and be that carry for his team. And he did it on the Cassidy. It was a very volatile matchup in the mid. And the scariest thing is that's not even where Cassidy's really strong. He wasn't level 16. Yeah. He didn't have his Grail. He didn't have a Lich Bane. There was going to be a point in that game where anytime Anne went near anything, all you do is sit in a brush. You stack up as we see them going through some more strats, probably thinking how many riff walks can we stack in a brush there? <laughs> Because all you do is you stack it up, then you flash Rift Walk, W the AD carry, and they die. I have a feeling deft after that. It's like, come on, man, make your Rift Walks work. Let me have the lanterns <laughs> after oh, having to oh, run away there. He had flash during that little moment. I don't know why he didn't just flash over the top of the wall and then just join his team. Instead, he runs around, and then he blows his flash at the end to die to the Fizz Sea Stone Trident. And that's the interesting thing, though, about these high-octane games is that we do start to see these high-level players make mechanical errors or small judgment errors in their split-second decision-making, and it really is about instincts and which of these teams is going to capitalize on those minor mistakes from the other. With so many team fights, that's exactly what happens, and AHQ just need to compose themselves and slow the game down for them. They really need to look at the bigger picture and see what's happening when they commit for a kill, what's happening when EDG makes a move. Look at the weaker side of the map. And they, it looked good in the early game, to be honest. That tower dive against Korra was a good idea, but failed execution turns the whole game around. Off that, they probably could have been able to snowball a little bit, but at this rate, I don't even trust them to be able to take that lead and close out against EDG. Now, for AHQ, I do have to point out Anne in that game doing a lot of work on Lucian. When we look at just DPS in those fights, positioning pretty well, but again, you know, sometimes getting lost in, you know, the mix, eing in, getting caught out yeah, by the Cassidy. Yeah, the Cassidy's going to catch him pretty much no matter what. And the game was 29 minutes long. If Cassidy hits level 16, it's even worse. Protecting on Anne basically becomes impossible. He's going to reach him, and you just have to deal with the Cassidy once he does. And, and that's the situation. I want to hit on that because that's actually the rest of AHQ's fault. Twice now they've ran anti carries against their AD, uh, AD carries, and they've done absolutely nothing to shut the, shut the heck room or now the Cassidy down. Mm -hmm. These are two champions that are both punishable during the laning phase, and Ann needs the rest of his team to win those lanes so he can do his job. If he, they don't do their job, he's not going to be able to do anything. All right, so then you point to the mid lane there specifically for this matchup with the Cassidy West door on Fizz not making as much of uh, an impact in terms of pressure in that lane early on or is that Mountain not paying attention you know to that lane and, and putting pressure there? I think it was fine for him to be honest. Um, we are expecting him to fall behind a little bit in CS not as much as the as it happened, but towards the mid game, his team fighting was perfectly fine. What I want to look at is the lane swaps that happened. At this point, there's going to be a lot of mind games for AHQ. They want the lanes. They have strived in an environment where you can camp the 2v2, but they haven't gotten it. The lane swaps have really shafted them over. So 
perhaps go for a blind lane swap. You know, you go for a five point defense and then you just blind lane swap. It's very difficult to scout. EDG would have to invade heavily and commit to a lot of wars to one side of the map and you can still pull off a blind swap. They need to get the 2v2. If they don't, I think they're just gonna get blown out of the water. Yeah, because twice EDG's got the first turret, got the, I guess, first successful play, then made a play on the other side of the map straight away to shut down exactly what AHU were doing. The point that I was trying to make is that Kassanen shouldn't have his turret up in that game and it was never really under pressure. So I just don't think they committed heavily enough to the strategy of getting it into the mid lane and shutting it down. So we're looking at some composure coming through for AHQ, as you mentioned, as we look forward to this next game, though, Zyrene, on the side of EDG. How do they close this out in a clean 3-0? They just keep doing what they're doing. They get the lane swap. They make sure that they have their jungler clear love pretty much in the same spot as always. Like basically just stick to the formula. Pick an anti-carry to shut down the carry of the enemy team, whether it's a top laner, whether it's a mid laner, and just snowball it. They are taking these fights and they just have mechanical execution two notches better than AHQ. And that's what they're relying on right now. And it's working. And I love it. It's a clean 3-0 because no one is ever going to call these games well, clean. when I say clean 3-0, just meaning they don't drop a yeah, game, right? I know what uh, you mean. Yeah, it, well, I mean, I would the have argued the same point is that you need to clean up your execution and your mechanics here for EDG because, as we mentioned, across the board seem to be one notch up in all of the positions. So, as long, you know, both teams could be doing the same thing as long as you're executing slightly better. Of course, you'll come out on top. So, composure for AHQ but composure only when they're up there with these guys in terms of gold. We saw it at that 30K mark here in this game. They were even, but when they're down 5K, how do they get back into it? Oh, well, they keep fighting. They have to focus on turrets. And we saw at one point at the second dragon, we thought, okay, give up the second dragon. You have the first one, go for the top tower, get the lane swap, and then defend your tier two bottom. But some sort of brain fart happened to them and then they gave up their tier two bottom when they clearly saw that EDG was rotating into that. They really need to prioritize in denying the gold for EDG. When you get the, the only dragons that matter are number one, number three in certain compositions, and the fifth one. Like You can give up tier two, the second dragon to get an influx of gold. They really need to prioritize because they're not farming as hard as they should be, and they're falling behind in items because of it. Yeah, and the other thing I want to point out is that EDG right now are showing absolutely nothing. So you might be thinking that they're heading into these games very messy, but they don't have to show anything else. If they can win another messy game, plays right into their hand. We haven't seen Jinx. We haven't seen Nunu. Yep. They have heaps more tricks left. All right, well, we're going to step away while the team prepare for game three between Edward Gaming and AHQ Esports Club. Keep it tuned right here. We'll be back in just a second. They saw the first pitch from EDG. We'll see if they can repair it. And the Shark comes in, but he's exhausted all the same. Not a lot of damage coming through. Force to jump back out, but Zip goes in. Goes for the Mega Narcoro. Tries to limp away from this one. Getting it up by Westor. Goes down to the passive. And now Two. more kills come through with Playful Trickster. Mako point blank. Baron actually has about 1,500 HP. Nobody can really keep fighting for it, but they're trying to push everybody, so Baron is attacking them. To start the series out, 0 and 2, Ooh. a re-engage comes <laughs> in. I don't know if it's going to be enough, because Pawn is crushing everybody. EDG take game two over AHQ.